You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Welcome to T-Minus Deep Space from N2K Networks. I'm Maria Varmazes, host of the T-Minus Space Daily podcast. Deep Space includes extended interviews and bonus content for a deeper look into some of the topics that we cover on our daily program. Saxavord Spaceport is weeks away from hosting its first launch. I caught up with CEO Frank Strang to find out what it takes to build a spaceport, where the idea came from, and what we can expect in the future. My name is Frank Strang. Um, I'm the chief executive of the Saxavord Spaceport, formerly known as the Shetland Space Centre up in the north of Shetland. I am one of the founder shareholders and directors of the, of the operation. Thank you so much for joining me today, Frank. I'm thrilled to be speaking with you. We've been reading so much about what's going on at Saks of Ward and the the really interesting updates as well as things like the Bronze Age settlement that was discovered, all these really interesting (laughs) bits of news. And I'm I'm thrilled to be speaking with you and I'm so glad you could join me today. So um, I would love if you could walk us through your vision for the the site at Saks of Ward once it's up and fully running. What, What do you want to see happen there? Oh my goodness, um, we've got a long way to go. We've come a long way. The finished product, if we ever get to one, will be um, a multi-use spaceport right up um, on the north of, of of the UK. So once is the most northern inhabited island in the UK, as I'm sure you're aware, and we're up there at almost 61 degrees north. At the moment, we're building three launch pads, um, so we're multi-use. We're looking to build two more, so that'll be five, which will give us a sustainable spaceport. But we're also building a ground station network. Um, and as you alluded to, we've got the Bronze Age settlement. So a big thing um, for us is how can we create a sustainable um, business? And that hinges around um, marrying science with the arts, with tourism and the environment. So we're looking to build um, a, a brand new eco hotel, a tourism hotel. That will be about a $90 million build. Um with lecture theatres and um, and some shops and uh, a music venue and uh, have um, resident uh, artists and resident ecologists and resident scientists. And we're looking to bring the airport back online. Believe it or not, our little airport on Annans used to be the busiest heliport in Europe um, in the 90s because of the oil industry. And we are looking to bring lengthen the runway, bring that online, so our clients can fly in directly, and we can um, bring in both tourism and tourists and clients. The final vision is, you know, is, is a pretty complicated jigsaw, but tied into that, you know, some of the things that we're really proud of already is our education and STEM outreach program. The other thing that, lastly, I'm very keen on building on the spaceport site is our own space environmental and ecological controls centre so we can use the data that we're bringing down to help save the planet. It's not new, but we can do this all in one location. We need to start with building, you know, the launch facility and and we're way down the the line with that now. That's fantastic. Spaceports are something I mentioned earlier we're very passionate about here on our show. It's not often I get to talk to someone who's in the process of building one. They are difficult to get off the ground. Sorry for using that metaphor. But I'd love to know what sort of motivated you to 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 make a spaceport. That's not it's not an easy undertaking. What I get asked this question a lot. There's not one single answer. Is that my wife and I had acquired um, over in the states where you are just now many years ago. You had a, a program that that was. Um, elicited by the DOD called the Base Realignment and Closure Program, which is basically the BRAC program, where all bases, military bases, were turned into developments not far from where you are in um, in Boston is the Peace Development Site in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And funnily enough, that's where I cut my teeth in base development. Um, And there you go. And that's probably what motivated me, to be honest, is that I acquired the site in... 17 years ago, um, this, the Saks of Ords and old Royal Air Force space. And I'm an, and I'm an old Royal Air Force officer. Um, and the vision was to turn it into, 
It was to regenerate it and bring employment back to the island, create a future for the kids. And at that point, if anyone had said to me I would be building a spaceport, I'd said, I don't know what you're drinking, but can I have some of it? We were looking at tourism and ecotourism. We've got lots of orcas and otters and, and puffins on island, and we were looking to support the oil industry. And it was quite a tough gig, especially when we went through the recession. Out of the blue, the UK government sent out a request around the north of Scotland to locations that they thought would be interested in supporting a new initiative, which was called the UK Pathfinder Launch Programme. The space, as you don't need me to tell you this, the space industry, to me, is like the new industrial revolution. It's a phenomenal growth. The UK government, we've always had a satellite industry. Um, 60% of the world's CubeSats are designed and built in, in the central belt of Scotland. But we never had a launch industry. So the government launched a competition to find the optimal site for launching small sats into space from the UK. The emissary that went round the islands um, came to the, our local um, our local authority, our local council, and said, would Shetland be interested in launching um, rockets? And that's all we knew. So they came to me and um, said, would you be interested in participating in this program? And we genuinely didn't know too much about it. I'm an ex-Air Force officer, so I, I know a bit about aerospace and, and space, but and gradually we got sucked into the sector and we realized that our site on Anst was the optimal site because of our geographic location. And five, six years ago, um, I decided to throw my hat in the ring um, with our team, um, try to get into the space economy. And we didn't know as much as we know now which is probably a good thing, because had we known... <laughs> One would hope. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have That's done the it. right direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and bit by bit, we, we, got, we, we held a symposium, invited the great and the good from the European space industry up to, up to Anston, up to Shetland, and everyone said, this is a great location. So that put the gas in our tank that said, okay, let's go for it. So with um, my fellow um, directors... We, we um, put some money into the pot and off we went and we went off to learn our, our craft, pardon the pun. And we were the last people in the UK to enter this competition. And the competition was actually won by Lockheed Martin and an American company well, uh, called ABL Space Systems from LA. But they were looking at another location which didn't quite work. So long story short, the um, the government um, novated the the Pathfinder program from another location to us. We went off to raise the money, um, had to secure the planning permits. Um, we had to learn a lot about the industry. And a lot of my guys are ex-Air Force pilots and some of them have been in the space industry. And bit by bit by bit, um, we, we we grew the company to where we are now. And in the last five years, you know, we've gone from being at the bottom of the pile to leading the way in Europe. You know, and that's come at a, a, a cost, but it's hugely exciting. And I, I've got an awful lot of pride in my team because I, I, I'm the least technically able in our team. It's the team below me that are making it all happen. So what gave me the impetus was somebody told us we couldn't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to any Scotsman, if you tell them you can't do something, you say, well, we're going to do it. But also it felt like the right thing to do because the jobs that we're creating – the educational program, you know, I don't know if you've been following our website, you'll see that in the summer on our outreach program, our online um, the classroom, we had a quarter of a million kids participate from all over the world, from the UA, from Europe, from um, Sri Lanka, a quarter of a million kids. That's incredible. You know, and um, that's a legacy that we're all very pr proud of. So I probably haven't answered your question, but we fell into it by accident. It's all consuming, as anybody that's in the space industry will tell you. We started off with four employees. I've now got just over 84 employees and growing. And we have no clients now. We've got multi-clients. All we've got to do now is get our spaceport license completed and, and away we go. Yeah. And fingers crossed for you on the license. Yeah. I know that that is it's a very, waiting game. So Very close. So... We, we're, we're weeks away from being awarded it.
We'll be right back. My goodness, that is extremely exciting. Uh, I... I wish you all the best because that is, I know everybody's waiting for you and we're all cheering you on for that. That's fantastic news. Oh my goodness. Um, Because I was going to ask about uh, suborbital flights because I know that there are some, there's some uh, work with, with high impulse. Uh, Can you give us an update on what's going on with suborbital? Yeah. So suborbital, we've got, um, we've got several clients that are looking to launch and high impulse have been with us now for goodness, last three or four years, testing their engines. They've come over from Germany. It looks like their first, um, suborbital maybe from Australia, uh, but that's all about timing. But their second will be with us in Q two or three of next year. Um, so we've got high impulse um, who are who are then looking to do multi launches. You know, then to go orbital with us. Um, we've got um, a company called Skyrora um, also looking to go suborbital next July. Coincidentally, at the same time that Rocket Factory Augsburg are looking to go orbital. You know, so we've got. High Impulse, uh, Skyrora on the suborbital front, and then we've got RFA looking to go orbital, and then we've got uh, ABL Space Systems looking to go orbital under the Pathfinder program. So next year, we should have between four to five launches of some shape or size um, between March and, and the end of the year. But that's because we've got three pads. Remember, you know, you know, we're, we've deliberately created this multi-use facility. Um, High Impulse conducted a very successful engine test a few weeks ago. Um, and they're ready to rock and roll. They're really nice guys. There's a lot of nice people in this, in this industry. Yeah. But um, I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah. There's great. a lot of nice yeah. people. You know what I love about it is it's international. You know, so we've got two German clients in High Impulse and Rocket Factory Augsburg. And yeah, RFA have got 17 different nationalities working for them. And they can all speak better English than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Isn't that always the way? Yeah. Isn't that always the way? Well, these are very exciting updates. I know you're still in the process of getting Saks of Ward up and running, uh, but if, if it's not too presumptuous to ask, what advice do you have to others who might be trying to spin up a spaceport where they are? I know that's a, not a small undertaking, but... It's a good question. And the problem, well, well, let's put, when's a spaceport a spaceport? You know, I think you've got 40 spaceports in the US, of which 14 are licensed and four are really operational. What is the function of the spaceport? We've had a battle. You know, there's been, you know, there's been illness, death, um, divorces, almost bankruptcy to get us to where we are. And everyone's been bonded by fire. So first of all, you need a strong team. But you need to be in the right location. And our battle to build the spaceport, if we weren't in the right location, it would be impossible to fulfill. So you need to be confident in the location. You need to have a team. Get rid of the egos. You know, we have no, you know, um, everyone that needs to be, I always say the most important person in your, in your organization is the lowest paid, whether it's your cleaner or, 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 or whatever. You know, we, we don't have egos in our organization. But the most imp- important thing is what I call stickability, determination, because it's not easy. We've, we've got highs and lows, highs and lows. You know, just when you think you're there, something else will come at you. I'm sure Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos will say the same. So my advice would be you've got to be confident in your location. You've got to have a team that works as a team and never give up because that's the most important thing. If you give up, you know, you're toast and there, it'd be very easy to walk away. And you also got to remember why you're building it. You know, we're building it. One, you want to make money. Of course you do, but it's a legacy for the future. You know, we, you can't change this planet. You can't create jobs for young people, you know, unless, unless you, you, and, you know, and when, when I was young, a, a satellite was the size of a small car costs millions and millions of dollars. Now it's the size of a cup of coffee and you can build one for ten to thirty thousand dollars. You know, the, the industry's moving and changing constantly. Um so it, it's the industry of now. So that's why we're building it. But anyway, go back to it. stickability. Don't give up because it's that's the hardest that's the hardest of all. I can absolutely imagine that and it is definitely a long game. It takes quite a long time to get this going. <laughs> and every rocket company will tell you they're going to launch in April. 
do they mean April this year, next April, or the following April? You know, because it's a, it's, it's complex. But once you know, but once those um, you know, once those launchers are ready, you know, a bit like SpaceX, you know, they're they, they say, you know, it's like buses or or coaches. So it is a long game, and we rather naively at the start, we thought we'd be ready two years ago, um, and Lockheed thought we would be ready two years ago. Um, everything moves to the right. For me, people ask me what it is about space. For me, it's the culmination of the skills that I've developed over the years, either as an Air Force officer or in tourism. Um, I, I think I told you earlier, you know, we have a small distillery in the spaceport. So we need yes. me and, uh, and the, our Shetland Real Gin and our Countdown Gin and everything around the spaceport is a, is a, a potpourri of lots of different things. And I think that's what differentiates us from others. We're not a one-trick pony. We're not just a launch site. You know, we have our ground station network. We've got our tourism offering. We've got our community um, stuff that we've got going on. So it's really, it's a community within the community. And I think that's why I love it. That's it for T-Minus Deep Space for November 4th, 2023. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in our show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. <laughs>